Um, we have one in theater, so we're very excited to have um, Mandy here. Um, a little bit about Mandy. Let me go ahead and read a bit of her, her bio, although everyone knows Mandy. Mandy Connor has been a theater teacher in the Central Texas area for 25 years. Mandy, who looked like you're 18 years old still, uh, she began her love for theater while attending McClendon Community College and Texas Tech University, where she earned her Bachelor of Arts in English. She has earned 13 trips to the regional UIL one act play meet, including her original productions, A Go, Lafayette No. 1, Should Not Cause Harm, Unclaimed, and Eleven, and has had seven appearances at the UIL state one act play meet, including her original productions of Lafayette No. 1 and Should Not Cause Harm, earning first runner-up in 2010. She received the 2018 K-12 Educator of the year from the Texas Educational Theater Association and the 2020 UIL Sponsor Excellence Award. In addition to teaching, directing, and playwriting, Mandy is a motivational speaker and conducts creativity workshops throughout the state. Mandy resides in China Spring, Texas with her husband, Chris, and her daughters, Edie and Josie. It is my pleasure to welcome our presenter today, uh, Mandy Connor. Take it away, Thank Mandy. you so much. I am so um honored and humbled to be here uh i i love teaching i love looking at the screen and getting to see all these faces that i know and love um thank you paula uh, there was a uh i went to texas tech and paula was i think a grad student when i was there and i just remember um i met my best friend uh at Texas Tech and the first time I ever met her, I watched, I had just watched a show that Paula had directed and I was sobbing uncontrollably because I was about to get married and it was about marriage and and that's how I met my best friend. So um, Paula has played a bigger part in my life than she realizes. <laughs> um, I am so excited to be here today and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about just kind of my rehearsal process what I go through, some things that have worked for me, they may work for you. You may have some things that are way different, but if you can take just a little nugget of something or find one thing that you're like, oh yeah, let me try that, then today will have been a success. Um, I love, I'm, I'm pretty extra. I like doing things in a big way. Um, so I, before I even start a show, I really try to get the hype up for whatever show I'm doing. If it's in the fall, I start hyping up the musical as, you know, a cup about a month or two in advance. Um, but the same thing with, with one act. And um, I have this, I'm a bit, I love Pinterest. I, I love being on Pinterest. I feel like I should get PD hours for being on Pinterest. Um, but I start a, a, like a, it's my Pinspiration board. Things that uh, I'm looking at in, in, in design, in character, and then I start printing those pictures out and I put them on this board in my classroom so that students are now looking visually. They're like, ooh, what's that? Ooh, what's that? And they're starting to ask questions about the next show. And I and I am very vague. I'm like, well, I guess you can start researching and see what you can find out. And now I've gotten a student, number one, interested. Number two, starting the research process before they've even auditioned. Um, and that's exciting to me when kids start getting invested before they even audition. And some kids are like, I don't want to be in it, but I want to know more about it. So I've taken my, you know, kid that's like in theater one because they have to, and I've already started them thinking like a theater person. Um, so that's the whole pre-audition uh, rigmarole, I guess. So then I have auditions. Um, for one act, I like to do auditions. I like to give them the monologues um, from the show. Normally I would have them choose one and in class they find, you know, we work on finding their own, but for one act, it's our competition show. That's, I want to see who can play these roles or what they sound like in these roles. If they can get that grasp of the language, if they can um, show me what I'm looking for basically. Um, and so for our audition process, they'll come in, they'll complete their monologue. Um, and then I do some movement um, exercises. We do like, uh, you know, machine or abstract art so I can see how they move their bodies. And that's telling me something, but I also do, I'm a big, I'm big into team building. I love team building because it shows me who my leaders are. 
It shows me who my kids who really want to participate. And it shows me those kids that are really shy and have a hard time getting out of their box. Maybe they had a great audition, but they are having trouble really like connecting with other people. So that's something for me to be able to observe early on in the audition process. So I do, they do the monologue, we do some movement, we do some team building, and then we do, um, oh, my brain just died for a second. Um, then we do some cold reads so I can see how they work with one another. So I do one audition session. That's just my preference. Um, and then, because by then I know the kids, I know what they have to bring to the table. Um, I've, I've seen them now for a couple of hours working together. And from there, I cast a company. I didn't always do this. I used to cast it right then and there. These are the roles that you get. And then I you know, shot myself in the foot because these kids weren't able to after... You know, that was just kind of a fluke, great um, audition. So I started casting a company and um, we started, when I cast my company, we start rehearsals the next Monday after auditions. I post the company list on Friday so I can run as fast as I can away from the company list. I have the stage manager there making sure everybody's, you know, uh, appropriate and how they handle being on it or not being on it, because that helps me for future auditions. Um, so Monday we start. And from there, I talk to them a lot about, we're not, I'm not gonna cast this show for a good two to three weeks. And we're gonna do lots of team, more team building. We're gonna do lots of um, cold reads or scene work just to see who fits where. Um, and I always let them know that when I post the cast list, it is a work in progress. And I am all, I always reserve the right to change things around. And so after about two or three weeks, after reading, after team building, after um, I give anybody a chance to read, you know, we redo monologues or they change monologues or they try something else. I give everybody an opportunity to kind of fight for what they want, not in that way, but they feel like they have a little bit more um, control, I guess. Um, then the night before, when I start to realize, okay, I think I've got it figured out. I think I know where everybody fits in this puzzle. Um, I give them a cast list. I mean, I give them a, a blank cast list. And I talk a lot about, um, if you were the director, who would you put in these roles, but you can't cast yourself? And so they are thinking, oh gosh, you know, and they start casting. I make them sit in silence and spread out a lot in the auditorium. And that's their exit ticket for that um, rehearsal. And they come in, they, every time, every kid that hands it in, they're like, man, that was so hard. That was so hard. I didn't know casting was so hard because a lot of people fit. And I was like, exactly. So then sometimes, sometimes that tempers um, how they accept the cast list once it is finally posted because now they've all invested. Now, during those two to three weeks, we do a lot of table talk. Um, we talk about the time period. We um, have, I split them into little, I call them their home base groups. So um, if I know kids, you know, kids get very clickish. So at the very beginning, I start putting them in little groups and uh, kind of getting them out of their norms, getting them out of their friend groups so that they can start to build those relationships. Um, so they're bringing in, like maybe one day we have a music day and everybody has to bring a piece of music that reminds them of this play. Or we have to bring pictures of what we think this, um, this town or this, uh, this location looks like. Um, maybe they bring an object that represents the show to them. And sometimes we start making a collage of all the different things that remind us of this show. So it's like a work, it's like a living, breathing um, Pinterest board that they are now putting effort into, that they are investing in. So then I finally, you know, post the cast list. And again, I give them a weekend to recover from if they, you know, got the role they wanted or got the role, didn't get the role they wanted. 
And then we start digging into um, actual rehearsals. We'll have a read through. Um, we do team building exercises every single day, whether it's a big one or whether it's a small one. Um, I switch up who they're sitting with. My, my charge is always, you know, we always, we like circles here in the theater. So every time we sit in the circle, they need to sit by somebody new. I believe that creating a good company is starting to build relationships with everybody, not just their little clicky friends, not who their best friend is. I don't want them sitting by their best friend every day at rehearsals. Um, I want them reaching out. I have a long talk with my seniors and my juniors and I, you know, it is their job. I put the responsibility on them to bring in those freshmen, bring in those sophomores, make them feel at home. We do a lot of talking about leaving your legacy and this is where it all starts is in that rehearsal process. Um, so we do the team building, we do a read through. Um, I like to include the tech crew in that read through so that they are reading the stage directions. They are, if, I, if, if I've already gone through and done my homework as a director and decided light cues or sound cues, which by the way, I don't, cause I'm not that, <laughs> I'm not that, uh, forward thinking. Um, but some people do. Some people have it all blocked out and all mapped out. And uh, kudos to you. Uh, that's an impressive skill that I wish that I had. Um, anyway, but I try to include my tech crew and my stage manager and everybody in the read through process so that they feel a part. Um, I'm kind of all over the place and I'm sorry for that. I'm just excited to be here. <laughs> um, so let me describe to you what my rehearsal looks like just a day in the life of a rehearsal a one act rehearsal so kids come in they go to the dressing room they put on their rehearsal clothes i require all my kids to wear rehearsal clothes usually it's like gray sweats and a white or a black t-shirt so that everybody looks the same they have to wear some just soft-soled shoes uh usually black soft-soled shoes um so that they're not messing with things. They're not showing stuff. They're not, everybody's in the same boat. They come in, um, we do laps around the auditorium. So they run their three, five laps. I start out small. I'm like, okay, this week we're gonna do two laps. And by the end, we're doing like 10 laps. Um, when they come back from their laps, they, um, Usually a junior or a senior will lead some vocal warmups for about five to 10 minutes. Then um, another group of kids will lead some physical warmups. Um, they do, you know, sometimes yoga, they'll do, you know, <laughs> the elementary like uh, picking kind of like all the little calisthenics that they learned in elementary school, they pull those in. Um, sometimes it's jumping jacks, sometimes it's abs just depends on who, by, who I've given that responsibility for the day. Um, after that, we usually go to our home teams or our home bases. And I, we talk about our rose and thorn just to kind of transition from the end of the school day. So everybody in the group has to say one good thing that happened to them today and one thing that was hard or negative um, so that we can let go of those things and move on. I love the rose and thorn. My own children like to do that at the dinner table now. Um, so we all do our rose and thorn at night at the dinner table. Um, after that, I try to do some team building games, whether it's just silly. Um, we play a lot of team tic-tac-toe. Um, you can find that on Pinterest, look under team building games. There's a ton of them. Um, we do some silly ones like, there's one where you can get a pair of like pantyhose and see how many balloons you can fit into it and put it on the one person's head or see how many rolls of crepe paper you can wrap around somebody. Just silly things to kind of break the monotony of, um, of rehearsals. It's also they're building relationships during that. It's also sometimes preparing them a little bit for competition, letting them be competitive, letting them find that competitive spirit. Um, so after a team building game, then uh, it depends on where we are in the rehearsal process. Um, I'm a pretty organic director. I have in my brain 
how I want it to look. Um, for each scene, I kind of start with a picture. I want the picture on the stage to look, I, we work on the opening for, I swear, two or three weeks. And just when I think that I finished, I hate it. And then we start all over because I want that opening to be just right. Um, so my kids hate me sometimes. They're like, are you kidding me? We've just spent three weeks of our rehearsals working on the opening of this show, Miss Connor. I'll say, well, guess what? It's a creative process. Um, so once we get, I, I like to work in order. I like to work from the opening all the way through the ending. Um, I give them some freedoms. If they're not picking up on those freedoms, then I'm a little more heavy handed and you go, you stand there and don't move. You move here on this word. I don't like to have to do that, but not every kid is gonna understand my vision. And I talk about that from the beginning. I say, you know, this is the job that I'm paid for. Um, yes, it's a collaborative effort, but still there's gotta be a lead to the project and that's me. I get paid the big bucks. Um, and you guys are helping me. We're creating this vision together. When they feel a part of that process, they're going to give more. And that's the whole point is to teach them how to do it without having to tell them how to do it. So, um, once we've worked through it, I try to work through it. I tell them, you know, I tell them it's slam blocking so that we can get it all and do a run through but it's really not the, we got the three weeks on the opening and then I've got like two weeks to block the rest of the show so we can start running it. Um, so I try to say, okay, this scene's going to happen here. This scene's going to happen here. This scene's going to happen here so that when I work the next scene, I can say, okay, now you two know where this is going to happen. You know how it's going to start. Go play. Just go right over there in the wings and play. A lot of times I'll have a sound tech go over there with them and observe and give them feedback or I'll have the stage manager with one group so that everybody is working. Kids aren't just sitting there waiting for their turn. Everybody's working and exploring. And then at the end of the rehearsal, everybody comes back and shows what they've been working on. And that gives them a freedom to play without the director sitting there going, no, I don't like that. No, I don't like that. You know, every, I'm sure every teacher in here has had kids come up to them and go, well, I was thinking about this character and what if I did this and this and this and this and this? And I always say, Shh, go work on it and then show me. You can talk all you want, but if you don't figure out how to do it, I can't read your mind. We don't perform for psychics that we know of. Um, so when they go, I've had students tell me, I don't feel like an intimidating person, but to kids, I guess sometimes the director is intimidated, uh, intimidating. And so they're like, well, we don't want to do this in front of you, Ms. Connor, because then you're going to hate it. And then what happens? I said, well, then we change it. But by giving them those chances to work with a student observer, um, there's a little bit more freedom and a little bit I don't know, they have, I guess they give themselves permission to, to make those silly choices or to take those risks that they're afraid to take in front of me. So we come back, everybody you know, shows what they've been working on and then we move to the next day. So I try to get, you know, if you're not signed up for any kind of clinic, that would be my, my next goal is to get clinic worthy as the, as the dates seem to get closer and closer and closer, I find my clinics getting earlier and earlier and earlier. So I think my first clinic this year is the, the beginning of February, which scares me to death. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know that I'll have it blocked by February, but it gives us a goal. Um, so we were like, okay, this is gonna be our first run through um, at clinic. And we're okay with that. We want to try to get it you know, in 45 minutes for this very first run through. I'm very goal oriented with my kids every week at the very beginning of every week, 
we sit down and we set goals. What do you want to accomplish this week as uh, within your job description? What do you want to accomplish as an actor? What do you want to accomplish as a lighting tech, as a stage manager, as the sound tech? Um, what do you want to accomplish as a company member? How can you help the betterment of this company? And then we, I always try to give them a, um, or get them to set a goal academically as well. Um, so that we are staying on track and I don't lose kids to um, failing grades. So we're blocked. We're ready for our first clinic. Um, we're still continuing to do physical and vocal warmups every day. We're still doing team building every day. Um, we go to our first clinic, we get the feedback. And I think it's very important for my kids to learn, um, for our kids to learn how to take criticism. I make mine bring a, um, a notebook or uh, I put sections in their script for like notes. They need to bring their script to write notes and a pen or a pencil, and they should be writing everything that that clinician says. We're paying these clinicians to give us feedback. And then I watch kids just sit or play a game on their phone. And I'm like, we're wasting our school's money. So I encourage them to go through that. Um, even if it's a note that's for somebody else and they feel like, oh, that's a good one for me, then they're writing it down. It also is teaching them how to um, take criticism when we get further down the road to the actual contest. Um, I think that's the hardest time for our students to take criticism because that's where you know, the, the stakes are higher. And so if we're teaching them how to take criticism now, early on in the process, maybe it becomes a little easier when we are critiqued at district, at by district and so forth. Um, so we've come back from our first clinic. Maybe it was terrible. It usually is the first time. It's usually the worst thing that we've ever put out there and the kids are, are sad and forlorn. They're like, my gosh, Miss Connor, we just screwed it up. I said, great. Now we know what we need to fix. And so we sit down that first rehearsal back after a clinic and we don't get up on stage. We talk about the criticism. We talk about how did you feel when she told you that? How did you feel when he said you should do this? And I give them my feedback. I'm like, well, you know, I, I see what they're saying. I didn't agree with that. That's not really lining up with my vision. And that's okay too, because that's why we go. That's why we go to the theater so we can understand other people's opinions. So we, you know, we dissect all the, all the criticism and then we start applying it. Then we start, um, especially at this point in the process, um, we start really making some bigger goals. So what do we want for next clinic? What notes do we not want to get for next clinic? What, um, maybe you dropped half of your lines. Maybe your next goal is to get them all. Maybe um, you want to remember the blocking better. So as we go through those clinic experiences, we take it to heart, we build upon it, and we set new goals for the next time. So that when contest comes around, man, we're ready. We have, we are, we've been working on things. We've been accepting our, our weaknesses. We've been working on those, trying to get them better and better and better. And then you get to, you know, a week before district and the kids are tired. And they're like, I'm so tired of this show. Miss Connor, I'm tired of this show. I said, well, too bad. Suck it up, buttercup. We got more to go. And so I try to do different run throughs. So, um, I try to have a fun through the week before contest. Um, and it's my, it's their favorite thing. I start shouting out, like we start the show and I'll say, okay, I want you to start this show as a, um, as a Western. And so they start the show and they're getting into it and they're, you know, getting their cowboy on. And then in the middle of it, I'm like, okay, we're now in a scary movie. So then they switch. We're now in an opera. We are now in um, a Disney musical. And so then they start singing and it's silly and it's funny, but inevitably they find a new choice for their character. 
They're like, I didn't even think about that. When I like belted out this note, I felt something, Miss Connor, and I want to try to put it in. I was like, excellent, let's do that. And then they put it in and it's terrible. Or they put it in and it's great. But they've allowed, uh, we've allowed that silliness to give them some freedom to make bigger choices. Um, sometimes I will do, we will run it in reverse. Sometimes we, I will um, put everybody's, every cast, every character on a little piece of paper and they have to pick one up and that's the character they have to play. And all of a sudden they're having to play a different character than they are always used to. So they're like, I don't know the blocking. I'm like, better figure it out because here we go. Um, so that helps it keep it fresh. And we do this as, you know, if we are lucky enough, fortunate enough to, to advance, I try to do those things with every level. Um, we do outside rehearsals. We do, um, my favorite one is the, um, is our color rehearsal. Uh, if we're lucky enough to make it to regionals or state, I go and I get those little packets of um, colored powder and everybody gets a little packet and they only get like, you know, just a little bit. So they have to use it wisely and they have to use it on lines that are important. So by the end, everybody's colored and it, it, everybody's rainbow looking and we've had a blast, but maybe they've learned something else. They've dug a little deeper into that character, into a line meaning, into making it important. Um, after that, you know, I we're now at con we're contest ready by that time, in my opinion. Um, whether we're ready or not, we're there. Um, I talk a lot about professionalism. I talk a lot about how we handle ourselves at, uh, at contest, that we want to be kind and we want to be a great audience member if we're fortunate enough to get to watch other people perform. Um, I think that it's our job to, to teach our students proper audience etiquette, but also proper um, that proper competitive spirit where we don't go in the bathrooms and talk about somebody else's play because you never know who's in the stall uh, next to you. Um, I, I was the on the unfortunate receiving end of that uh, at regionals one year and um, I was in the bathroom and two young ladies were talking poorly about our show and I walked out and uh, they were like, oh, I said, oh, I said, just be careful what you say and where you say it. So we have some rules, you know, I want to give them time to, to, you know, chew on those bitter grapes once we get home, if, you know, if it hadn't gone as we wanted, um, but we have to wait till we're home and we have to wait till we're in a safe space. And then I'm like, okay, that's it. We don't complain anymore. We don't talk anymore about that. Let's move on to the next step if we get that, or let's move on to the next show if we get that. Um, so I guess that's where, I, I, no matter where we end, unless it's unless we get the great fortune to go to state, I always try to do a public performance after our after wherever we end. So if we end at district, we're going to do one more performance for the public because I don't want to end on a sour note. Um, I guess that's my process. I don't. That was a lot, but I want to know like some questions that you have. Um, what did I not answer? What do you want more clarification on? Sure, Mandy. Um, um, we had a couple of questions in the chat. I'll go ahead okay. and give them to you. But sure. folks, go ahead and drop your questions in the chat and we'll get them to, to Mandy. That way we don't have, you know, all this chaos happening and all this sound. Uh, Mandy, one question is at the beginning of run throughs, do you let them go all the way through to get the pacing of the show? How do you go about doing that? I do. Um, <sighs> I kind of let them sink or swim. Uh, we have a day where we are off book and if that's the day that we're off book, we're running it. And I may have to walk out of the back of the auditorium while it's happening and they're calling line every two seconds, but it's, it gets us through and, I'm like, and when I come in or when, I, when we're done, I say, okay, now you know. Now you know where we are. You can either get it together you can be replaced or 
we can stay in this, you know, this rut. And usually that's enough to go, oh gosh, we gotta get it together. So instant accountability, right? Yes, instant um, accountability. Do you call your entire company to each rehearsal or do you only call those involved in the scenes being worked on that day? I do call my entire company just because it's a team sport for me. Um, one act is my sport. And I think that if we're gonna do this together as a team, we're gonna do this together as a team. Um, if they are not working on a technical element, if they're not working on a scene with a scene partner, then they're in the audience, they're listening, they're watching, they're observing, they're taking notes. Okay. Um, one question, or actually two part, um, how long is your rehearsal process? I'm assuming like when, how many weeks do you work, I guess, before okay. going to district? And the second part is, how many hours a day do you rehearse? But I will remind everyone that you have eight <laughs> hours during right. the school week, okay? From Monday morning till the last bell, so That's go ahead. Right. Um, we usually start, I, I try to do auditions in um, November before Thanksgiving break. It doesn't always work out that way. So that they have Thanksgiving break to kind of get over any sad feelings, the kind of, you know, or they have Thanksgiving break to read the script to see what it's all about. Um, we only do a few rehearsals before break. Um, that's when we do a lot of the table talk. We do um, cold reads and things like that. I try to give a cast list before Christmas break so that they have the break to work memorization. Um, after that, we rehearse Monday through Thursday, um, usually about an hour and a half a day, so. Okay. Um, this question, which I'm curious about, um, can you explain further the color rehearsals with the color yes. powder? How do you do that? So um, I go on Amazon and it's, oh, I can't, I'm on the spot right now and I can't think of what it's called. Um, somebody will know it's a certain powder and there's different colors. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a festival in the Middle East and I can't think of it, but anyway, you can go on, it's like cornstarch, like colored corn, holly powder, thank you. Um, and if you, you can buy different packages of uh, different colored powders. So each student, um, every, every person in the company gets uh, like a little baggie of this powder. And um, they, like when we're running through, if they can do it on a light cue, the tech, can do it on a light cue, on a sound cue. Um, they can do it on, uh, you know, a, a, a scene change, a transition. But I ask my actors to kind of save it for a moment that they think is powerful. Um, you know, we teach our kids about verbs and using, you know, finding those kinds of um, motivations, those kind of, um, my, my, my brain's not working. Anyway, they, on an important word or an important phrase, they can throw it at another student. We all, we all wear sunglasses. It's all outside on the practice field. And um, I warn everybody beforehand to bring a, a change of clothes, to wear white so it'll show up. Um, and so it's just more of a, sometimes we do it with water balloons, um, which is also fun. Or we have, I have big uh, buckets with sponges so they can throw a sponge full of water on that important line. It just kind of gets them out of their mundane process and helps think a little bit differently. By the end, nobody is thinking about doing it on an important line. They're just thinking how they can get the other person wet or dirty, which is still fun. It's still team building. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Uh, do you have trouble with the kids not wanting to do the public performance because they are disappointed, but in advance or something? You know, I, I haven't run into that yet. Um, I've had it where that performance is the best performance we've ever had. I've also had it where it's not as energetic as the performance before. I think it just depends on how we frame it for our students. Um, and you know, if we are, if we're down in the dumps and like, man, we should have, we got robbed and all of this stuff. It's the nature of the contest. And, um, you know, a lot of times we're doing it for our seniors who it's their last performance. So we make it all about them. And when it's not about, when it's about somebody else or a bigger purpose, there's a lot more buy-in. 
right, right. Do you do weekend rehearsals? And if you do, how long do you do you rehearse like on the weekends? I try not to rehearse on the weekends. Um, you know, I have two girls of my own and during one act, they don't, get, my family doesn't see me as much. And so I try to reserve those weekends. Um, however, I do have a tradition that I love. Um, some people do lock-ins, but I'm not a good lock-in person. So either on spring break or one Saturday, we will do a 10 to 10 rehearsal. So they come up and it's mostly team building, but a lot of it is like, we'll do a run through or we'll work on uh, strike and set, getting that strike and set under seven minutes. Um, or we are, we're spending some time on tech stuff that needs to be fixed, or we are, sewing last minute costumes, or we are painting last minute props. Um, so it's just a time for us to kind of focus. And it's usually my kid's favorite thing to do. Okay. Fun, fun. Um, for auditions, do you allow students to watch each other's monologues performances? Do they get to audition in front of each other? I do, because they're going to have to eventually perform in front of people. So I, um, I, I don't open it up for everybody, but if they're auditioning, then they're watching. Um, I want them to learn to be encouraging to those people that are up there. Um, it's usually like a big love fest to me at auditions. Everybody's, you know, so excited for that nervous person that they've been kind of working with and they see them up there and they're like, yes. And when somebody does a great audition, there's just applause and cheering. And it's just, it's a very positive experience, or it has been for me. Great. Have you had an experience where you needed to replace an actor? Uh, can you talk about that experience about having maybe someone just, they're just not cutting it? Who knows? I have, and it's the worst. How do you and, handle it? Um, and, you know, I have a conversation with them. I don't, um, I don't just say, okay, sorry, you're out. We talk a lot, and I, I'm big on communication. And I, when I see this as an issue, like when I see this character, this kid just isn't working in this character, I ask them a lot of questions. You know, how are you feeling about this? Are you feeling like you're putting, you know, your, all that you have into this? Are you not connecting with this? So we have some of those conversations. I give them a chance to kind of remedy some of those things. And then I kind of let them know, hey, this is not, I can, I can feel that this is, not working for you would you be willing to you know um it's going to depend on the kid too because sometimes I'm like I'm sorry but I'm just going to go ahead and flip-flop you guys or I kind of blanket statement it sometimes I'm like okay today we're going to do a um, mix up read through and I'll see where those switch switches need to happen um but a lot of times by doing the casting the company early on and letting that naturally work out, it, it eliminates having to do that later. Now I have had to remove kids, you know, for lack of attendance or they're not, they don't, they're not committed. They're, they're late every day. Those are different things, but sometimes, you know, it, I guess it just depends. Cause I've, I've, I've switched kids and then I've just not because for the good of that kid, that's just what they needed. And if our show suffered, then our show suffered. Okay. Do you recommend scene work over run-throughs early in the process or vice versa? Ooh, that's a good question. I really prefer run-throughs earlier on. Uh, we do some scene work, but I feel like when they get the big picture, then they start feeling a little more comfortable in diving into that scene work. When they have a, 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 an outline, when they know where they're supposed to go, what happens you know, down the road, I think it allows them to dig a little deeper. So I do run-throughs early on and they're terrible. And then we're like, okay, where is our plot? Where is our story being told? Where is it not being told? What scenes need the most work before first clinic? So we're like, okay, this one and this one and this one. Then we start kind of fine tuning and dialing in. Okay. okay. Do you have a, um, a production class? Do you have a production class? I do. I have, um, I am changing schools uh, this year for 
I've been at one school for 24 years. So I'm a new teacher this year, which is a little scary. Um, I do have a production class. Um, and the way that I'm allowed to do it is they can audition. Um, it's a semester class. So they can be in the fall musical and in the production class in the fall. And then they have to re they have to audition for one act. And yes, it's in the middle of the day at my new school. So it's not as um, productive for rehearsals, I guess. You only mm -hmm. have that 45 minutes to, you know, we're not gonna dress out, we're not gonna, but we could definitely do some scene work in that class. Mm -hmm. So your one act play company comes from that production class yes. that you have? That you'll yes. Have? Now, where I'm going, my new school where I am, I don't, I'm not going to require, I'm, that's not gonna be a requirement yet because I'm still learning these kids and uh, sure. they're still learning me. And um, so it's more of a suggestion right now than a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, any techniques to help your students get off book early? Um, yes, uh, they are, they're way better at this than me. Um, this started early, like about 10 years ago, I had a kid who um, she didn't really, she had not a great home life and didn't have a lot of friends. So over the Christmas break or over Thanksgiving break, I can't remember. She made uh, note cards for every character in the play. And so it have the per the line before theirs and then on the back, their line. I mean, it was incredible. Well, it started something. So my students use flip cards and so anybody can help them with lines um if we're in the early in the process and i'm not and i'm working a scene on stage they're in the wings or in the audience or in the house somewhere working lines so um i, I think those flip cards are great i think you know we live in a, a digital age they can record you know the lines before them and then fill in their own there's so many all alternatives um but repetition is the is just the best mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um do you have a contract with these students with your one i play students with attendance policy and all that absolutely um i'm working on a new handbook for this uh new school because it's it's been under a different kind of leadership and so i want you know i want everything to be laid out for them they have to sign this contract um their parents have to sign this contract and i let them know you know what are what's going to kick them out of this show what's gonna you know, help them the best. I, I try to give as much information and as much um, communication with the parents as possible. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, a question about how you tackle projection and articulation during rehearsals. You have a lengthy warm-up process, right? You talked we about- We do, we do. So, you know, it especially gets more fine tuned once we get to those clinics. So they think they're going along great and you can hear them. And then we get to a new house and we're like, oh, we do have an issue or we do have that. So um, I, don't, I can't think off the top of my head, but I have, you know, every time I hear a good vocal warm up, I'll write it down or I'll, I'll mark it and I'll say, okay, you know, what are we going to do for projection? I'll ask on the, on that one act play directors page on Facebook, people are always giving lots of good hints and files. And, you know, these are the warm ups that we use. Um, what can I do for this? And people are very giving and kind to um, share those things. So I take those things that we need to work on and then we make them specific for our show. So if we're having projection problems, then maybe we're going to do like a round robin where one person is on the stage, everybody else is around in the auditorium. They're saying their lines and they're getting feedback from everybody in the house. Can't hear you, give a little bit more, push a little bit more from the diaphragm. So they're helping one another out and realizing, you know, this is what I need to tweak, this is what I don't. And as far as articulation, we start pulling lines from the show so that it's not just uh, some activity that they're doing, they're now making a part of what they're actually doing. Okay, we have a request that if, once you're finished with your contract, would you mind sharing it with others? Yes. And you're always welcome to share it with me and I can always post it on the UIL side or... Yep, okay. so I sure will. You can contact Mandy, all right? Yep. Um, another suggestion, um, my teacher says, my kids take a day to put the line before their line and their lines like in Quizlet and then love oh. to quiz each other throughout the day. 
So that's awesome. I yeah. love that. Mm -hmm. um, do you give your group a certain amount of weeks to be off book? How, how long does it take them? When, when, how early in the process are they off book? I try to do it pretty early. I mean, I, you know, it's not that long of a show. I, I try to give them um, maybe two weeks after the break, after the Christmas break. They're getting their, um, they're getting their character. Two weeks after Christmas break, we need to be done with lines. That's that's doable because I've seen it. I mean, I've had kids do it. So I know that it's doable. Are there kids that are going to struggle? Yes. And that's where you send that extra kid to help you. You know, the kids that has all their lines or that awesome stage manager or that alternate that is, you know, wanting to work hard. Um, I had an alternate once. Oh, my gosh. We were doing. I don't know. We were doing red noses and. I had an actor that was absent and I had an alternate that was so wanting to be in this production. And she was a little sad that she got alternate and uh, she filled in for a rehearsal. I said, Natalie, can you come in and fill in? And she's like, yes, ma'am. Um, she was off book. Like she did not need a script. And I was like, that's how you do it. You are the new line coach. You are the one that's, you know, now she had responsibilities the next three years. She was, the lead in every show because she worked so hard. So. Awesome. Awesome. Do you have favorite team building exercises? Um, I do. <laughs> um, anything they, okay. So we have, I get a big, uh, one of those big rubber balls from Walmart. This is the kid's favorite game, hands down. And I go on Pinterest and I look up like, get to know you questions. Um, and then we uh, I just write them all over that ball. So they have to throw the ball, somebody catches it, wherever their left thumb lands, they have to answer that question um, to everybody. You can, I like playing Have You Ever. Um, I like doing races. I like doing um, speed friending, anything that's gonna let them connect with another kid and make uh like oh I do that too that's those are my favorite awesome awesome um did you talk about how you picked your contest play I didn't um it has changed over the past 25 years um right. I I always look at who I have and that is my starting point I kind of make a list of here are my top like I know this sounds but coaches do this so we do too um here are my five best girl players here are my five best guy players um these are the these have proven to be the strongest um so i kind of look okay i have four strong girls and five strong guys so i go to like dramatist play service and i'm looking up four strong girls five strong guys and that's where i search um i look through the uh the list on uh on the UIL side, on the approved list, I'm like, okay, do I have this breakdown? I think that's the best starting place. Um, recently, I've started writing for my students. So with, not for them, but with them in mind, because I wasn't finding what I needed from them, uh, for them. Um, but I always start with what I have and, and what interests me. I may have the kids to do a certain play, but if I don't like that play, I don't wanna do it. <laughs> There you go. You have to have a reason to come to rehearsal, right? That's right. Um, That's right. Awesome. Um, I think time for maybe one or two more questions. A question okay. about how do you train your your stage manager? What do you do to train Ooh, that person? That's a really hard question and a really hard job. Oh, um, I, I try to train my stage manager in the fall. I really do. I look at kids who are interested. Um, and I'm like, okay, how about you try out, let's see what you can do in the fall. Um, so that that gives them some experience. I look at kids who are organized. I look for kids who are um, kind of that type A personality where they're like, okay, this is gonna happen. Maybe they're not the creative type, but boy, they keep a good solid binder. Um, those are the kids that I need, that I need to help me with. 
I, I don't know how I, how I train them, but just to keep them kind of by my side and say, okay, um, give them responsibility, see if they can handle it. Say, okay, tell me in 10 minutes, uh, I'm gonna work on this scene for 10 minutes. Tell me when it's time. In the meantime, go and check on this other thing or make sure the crew is doing this or blah, 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 blah. Definitely, definitely. And I, I think also like throughout the year, like if you like thespians or if you do the student activity yes. conferences or uh, yes. Texas uh, Theater Fest, there are always sessions on training that stage manager. So look for yes. those and I'll just give them some really good tips on just, you know, how to call a show and what do you yes. have to have in your stage manager box and how yep. to run a want to play technical rehearsal. So you'll yes. see, I know we have handouts on that and I know there are sessions, you know, throughout the year on just how to handle that technical rehearsal and give the yes. responsibility over to the students. Then, because you've Absolutely. got plenty of play, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, how do you keep your crew involved and engaged while you're doing scene work? I know you talked about early in the process with table work, but mm -hmm. like day to day, rehearsal to rehearsal, how do you keep them involved? Um, a lot okay. of time, well, if we are, they're either researching or they are applying. So if, um, if I have, if I don't have music yet, I'm like, go find me some music. And I put everybody on that. Um, they start working with the stage manager to start marking where the cues are so that everybody knows what happens when. Um, and they spend days and weeks on marking that script where those cues happen, where the sound cues happen, where the light cues happen. Everybody's learning um, the booth. Everybody's learning the specials. Everybody's learning the sound. It is a technical team so that there is always something to do. Um, and if not, then they are now taking notes, you know, on maybe directions that I've given so that we can go over those later. Okay. And I mentioned early quickly through her bio, but Mandy is a published playwright. All right. So I know her plays come, are, are published through play scripts. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. There's through play scripts and All next right. stage press and stage partners. Fantastic. So a question here is, what was your inspiration for Lafayette number one? Um, my husband and I took a 20th anniversary trip to New Orleans and we visited the cemetery Lafayette number one. And one of the tombs was for, um, was dedicated to orphaned boys. And there was something in that that just made me really curious. So much to my husband's chagrin, I started researching on that trip. I was like, well, look at this and look at this and look at this. And so I just got, I had never written a, a, a play before. So I thought, let me just see what I can tell about this experience. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, another comment about your, your plays being very inspirational and they enjoy reading them and hope to read more of your plays. So, and another one writes, you are one amazing director. Thank you for all your wonderful information. And what are the fees for the Mandy Connor fan club? So you have a lot of a lot of fans out there. Um, we appreciate you, all your wonderful, I don't even call them tips, you know, all these incredible suggestions, ideas, um, exciting new strategies for um, implementing this year for your plays, whether it's the one I play or your, your fall show. And, uh, you know, Mandy, thank you from UIL. We thank you for thank being you. here. It's no wonder you're our, you know, UIL, Sponsor Excellence Award winner. And uh, we appreciate you folks. If you have questions, you can always send them to me. I can always get them to Mandy Connor. She's at China Spring, uh, China Spring High School, correct? And yes. uh, so thank you. Lots of you can see lots of thank yous in the chat for you. And I uh, appreciate you. Um, later on this afternoon at two o'clock, we have another uh, wonderful session planned with Sean Duthie from Holiday High School. Yay. And he is doing one on script. Today's really all about play. So the scripts, uh, strategies on editing your play, uh, making it, um, you know, scenes from ready, I think that's what it's called. So we have that at two o'clock and at three o'clock, we have a session with um, the folks from Concord Theatricals, formerly known as Samuel French, and they'll be um, uh, with us. And then at four o'clock, we have a session, an acting directing session with Destiny Miller from Fort, uh, from Fort, no, from Fort Bend ISD from Bush High School. And uh, she'll be talking all about um, theater safety for your actor, or mentally, emotionally, physically, all of that. So we'll see you guys later on this afternoon. And uh, thank you, Mandy, once again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Bye, guys. All right. Y'all have a good day.